is Liam Olds. And uh, Liam is an entomologist and is the founder of the Colliery Spoil Biodiversity Initiative, um, which has been going for a few years now to raise the importance of um, such habitats. And uh, Liam also works with bug life and uh, has also very recently um, set up the National Recording Scheme for Oil Beetles. And um, I, he has a fantastic range of knowledge across many different species groups. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what he's going to be able to um, show off and display about the wonderful habitats that have been discovered on some of these sites. So over to you, Liam. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, hopefully you can see my slides okay uh, and sound is good. Um, but yeah, yeah, thank you very much for having me along today. Uh, so as Martin said, yeah, my name is Liam Olds and I'm an entomologist based in South Wales and I run a conservation initiative called the Colliery Spoil Biodiversity Initiative, which is all about raising awareness of the really important biodiversity value uh, of colliery spoil sites in the South Wales Valleys. And I'm just going to kind of kind of show you sort of some of the examples of the habitats and the sort of species that you get on these really important sites uh, within South Wales uh, and hopefully across the UK as well. Great. Uh, and just to point out that unless otherwise stated, all the images are my own as well. Uh, so when I'm talking about um, colliery spoil, I'm talking just about the, the waste material that's left over from coal extraction. So there's many areas of the British Isles that have a long history um, of coal mining, that might be deep coal mining or open cast coal mining. Um, and then the sort of spoil material that's sort of left over as a waste product of that then is basically just, as you can see with this image, just a sort of often hillsides um, of, of just pure waste rock pretty much, um, containing various sedimentary rocks like shale and ironstone. Uh, fragments of coal of various sizes. Uh, they can also have varying sort of materials that from demolished sort of colliery buildings as well, like concrete and, and brick. Um, and then they can have all other sort of varying sort of waste materials as well. They can have sort of entire like dram carts and, and rails uh, and cables and all sorts, so a bit of a sort of historic dumping ground more, more or less. Um, and these sites are quite numerous. So in South Wales alone, we have about two and a half thousand of these sites. And I'm not sure what the figures would be across the UK, but you know, it's sort of quite a significant sort of um, land area that these sort of sites um, cover. Uh, and quite often then um, this sort of waste material was often tipped in the landscape. Uh, and in the South Wales valleys, they were often tipped um, on the mountain tops or valley sites to form these really iconic uh, spoil tips and really iconic features within the landscape of the South Wales Valleys, as you can see with these sort of three pyramids of Lambradach near, near Capilli, really quite amazing looking, looking sites. And they've undergone this really incredible transformation. So in, in just often just a few decades uh, from when the material was tipped through the powers of sort of natural, um, natural succession, they've gone from these sort of black eyesores um, within the landscape to these really important wildlife sites um, and they've done that all under, under their own steam um, and it's basically kind of what I'm talking to you about today is how, how these sites have become so important and some of the habitats and species that you get on these sites as well. Um, and just, just before I kind of go on to the habitats and species just want to sort of um, just explain as to why they're so valuable for wildlife and it all comes down to their diversity, they're really diverse sites with really varied topographies and uh, varied aspects um, the actual spoil can vary quite a lot both uh, between and across sites, um, uh, often um, across in a single site as well. Uh, so that's depending upon the material that's actually in the spoil and the hydrology as well. So you'll have areas where the spoil is very compacted and that's where you get your wetland habitats forming. And then in other areas, it'd be free draining where you get your heathland and your dry grass and habitats. Uh, the pH can go anywhere from very acidic to very alkaline uh, or on the same site. Um, and then the levels of disturbance vary hugely as well. And all of these sort of factors combine to form these really complex habitat mosaics. And that's what's really important, particularly for invertebrates, but also for other wildlife. And they're also really valuable because they are relatively undisturbed sites with the exception of sort of off-road motorcyclists on some sites, they don't really get much um, disturbance other than that. And they probably get less disturbance than nature reserves do because there's far less people on them and it's not dogs and other things. Um, and they have these really nutrient poor soils, which is really important for maintaining these sort of early successional habitats and maintaining these sort of open mosaics as well. And also encouraging sort of flower rich conditions as well. So I thought it'd just be sort of handy just to uh, kind of go through uh, some of the sort of key habitats on these sites uh, and sort of like some of the key species as well. Now, probably like the first sort of habitat that people often think of with these colliery spoil sites is bare ground. 
uh, and bare ground is um, a really important habitat, is an overlooked habitat, um, and the amount of bare ground on these site will vary quite widely between uh, sites depending on what stage of succession they're at. Uh, but where you've got sites like this, where you've got you know quite a lot of um, open bare ground, these are really ideal sites um, for a variety um, of invertebrates in particular. Um, you get get things like the grayling butterfly. So some of the best grayling butterfly sites in South Wales are um, old coal tips. And the grayling butterfly is one of these species that's undergone a widespread decline. Uh, it's considered a priority species for conservation. And it, it needs, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it needs these areas of um, bare ground. It needs the higher temperatures as provided by the bare ground in order to, to develop um, as larvae. So it's one of these ones that really just loves these, these coral spoil sites. It just loves the hot conditions that you get on these sites. Um, another species that you get in these areas and not anywhere near as, as rare as the grayling butterfly uh, are things like the green tiger beetle. Um, so a really beautiful species. And it just loves the, the open bare ground. It loves them, as you can see, it's got large eyes, large jaws. It's a, it's a visual predator. And it just sort of loves just scuttling along, along the bare ground and just hunting for, for various things like spiders and ants and, and caterpillars and that sort of thing. And you'll also get his larvae in the same area as well. But just, just beautiful um, creatures. Yeah, really beautiful creatures to see. Uh, and this is a, a species that you know you'll see commonly on, on most coral spot sites in South Wales. Uh, another sort of really important habitat on these sites are the flower-rich grasslands. Um, and as many of you will probably be aware, we've lost a, a huge amount of wildflower-rich grassland across the UK. Uh, and these colliery spot sites are actually some of the most wild, uh, wildflower-rich um, sites within South Wales, uh, as you can see. As you can see in sites uh, such as this, you've got you know large expanses of flower-rich grassland, and you can see you can sort of imagine how important these are for pollinating insects. In this particular site here, you can see this um, all the yellow that's flowering in the grassland here is kidney vetch, uh, which uh, supports a small blue butterfly, which is a, a rare species within Wales, and I'm sure across much of the UK as well. And one of these species that, that needs kidney vetch uh, in order to develop, so it's a real nice species to get on these on these colliery spoil sites. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it was my voice already. Um, we also have um, a wide variety of different bees as well. So I've recorded close to about 100 species of bee on these colliery spoil sites in South Wales now, um, and it included them, a large majority of them are solitary bees. Um, but I've also recorded 14 bumblebee species, uh, one of which is the brown banded carder bee, which it really loves these um, legume rich. Um, wildflower rich grasslands on these colliery spoil sites. And this is just a, another example actually of that same grassland that I just sort of showed you, but just at a different time of year. And you can just see the large expanses of wildflowers. And it's quite rare to get, you know, sites that are so rich in wildflowers uh, within our sort of British landscape at the moment. And this is why these sort of sites are so important um, in order to conserve um, and really important for our pollinating insects more, more than anything. And there's a wide variety of different plant species you get uh, on these sites. Uh, and unfortunately, I haven't got time to kind of go into them in many de much detail, but um, included among these are a variety of orchids and bee orchids that are always a, a pleasure to see and, and ones that you get on these um, colliery spoil sites uh, in South Wales. And you also get um, in, on these sites large amounts of common birds of trefoil, which is a larval food plant of the dingy skipper. Um, and the dingy skipper is another one of those species like the graving that needs those areas of bare ground um, in order for its caterpillars to develop. It needs the higher temperature. So it's a really sort of iconic species of these colliery spoil sites. It loves the early successional habitats. It loves the hot conditions. And this is actually, um, I would say, the commonest butterfly species that you'll probably encounter uh, on colliery spoil sites in South Wales, particularly within the month of May. Uh, you'll just see huge numbers of these. Um, yeah, you can't, can't even count how many you'd see um, on some sites, but just a really beautiful species. It doesn't quite live up to its name as a, as a dingy skipper. And the grasslands on these sites come in a huge variety, so they're not um, always sort of uh, really dry. Um, and quite often you can get sort of marshy areas, and that's tends to be where you'll get your small bird border fertility. Um, and like with the dingy skipper and the grayling, some of the best sites for finding small bird border fertility is also on colliery spoil sites. Uh, where they're sort of feeding on the violets um, in these sort of marshy grassland habitats um, and on buttercups um, and other things and as nectar as well. 
but in these grasslands then you will have a variety of other um, insects and other wildlife as well um, things like these microdon flies which are these dumpy flies that develop within ants nests um, and this particular species develops within the the nests um, of sort of red ants uh, myrmica species but always really nice to see and you'll also get a variety of different wax caps as well and i'm not quite sure of the figures um, on the number of wax cap species but it is it is pretty high um, uh, the most common of which really is the blackening wax cap, which tends to be the sort of the, the first colonizer amongst the wax cap um, species. And of course, um, wax caps are associated with mosses as opposed to grasses. So it really loves these, these sort of marshy um, sort of habitats on coal spots that tend to be sort of full um, of, of a variety of different mosses. Heathlands are another really important site on, on the site, um, particularly um, on these high altitude um, tips the, on the valley tops. They tend to be dominated by heathland habitat and they just look absolutely spectacular um, in sort of late summer, um, a sort of time when the ling heather is flowering. And these are predominantly heathland habitats, but you can get uh, wet heath habitat as well. Um, and it's these sort of sites that you get your, quite a lot of your reptiles, your common lizards, your slow worms, and your adders. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to see um, adders um, on these sites. You'll also get a variety of different um, insects that are associated with heather itself. Uh, these are things like true lovers knot um, and beautiful yellow endwing moths. Um, and this is just the, the caterpillar of the beautiful yellow endwing, which I think is um, just as beautiful, if not more beautiful than the adult. Um, really, really stunning looking thing. You'll also have its um, associated predators as well. Um, things like uh, red banded sand wasps uh, and things like that. Um, and one of my sort of favorite plants in these sort of uh, heat dominated sites um, is sheep's scabious, which I think is just a, a stunning um, looking plant. And I really love the sort of the vibrant sort of blue color. Um, and unfortunately, I don't see as much as I'd like to, but it's, it's just really a nice treat um, to see the sheep's scabious um, growing on these colliery sites. And you also get um, some rather sort of specialist bees um, in these sort of habitats as well, because you tend to get um, tormentil growing amongst the heather, and that tends to be um, the prime locations to find the tormentil mining bee, which is one of these um, priority species for conservation and has undergone a widespread decline. Um, and this is a species that collect pollen from tormentil, um, hence its sort of common name. But colliery sites are really important for the tormentil mining bee, um, as well as a, a variety of, of other solitary bees as well. And of course, the bilberry bumblebee as well, uh, that really likes these sites. Um, but a, a habitat that's um, really kind of unique within the South Wales context um, associated with these sites is like a heath habitat. And you can see you get these really impressive displays of bryophytes and lichens um, growing amongst the heathers. And you've got large clumps here of Pladonia lichens, or what's known as reindeer moss. Um, and when you kind of look closely to these, you've got these just absolutely beautiful, you've got a little miniature world going on uh, with lichens of all different si sizes, shapes, colors, species, um, to sort of more sort of like devil's matchstick, matchstick type um, lichens as well. And growing amongst these, then you'll have associated um, uh, fungi as well. So uh, one of the sort of lichen heath sort of fungi that I think of um, in particular, things like more club, um, as you can see, it's growing through the lichen heath habitat uh, here, but lichen heath habitat is a really, really sort of important habitat uh, on these sites within South Wales. And these sites also have this amazing ability to replicate peat bog habitats. Uh, so in certain areas, you'll get sort of large expanses of cotton grass growing, which um, I'm sure you'll know is a sort of typical sort of peat bog um, sort of plant. Also a variety of sedges as well. And then where you have sort of flushes is where you um, quite often get some interesting um, invertebrates, but you also get your uh, orchids. So southern marsh orchid is probably the most abundant uh, orchid that you get on these colliery spot sites, and they really love the wet flushes. Um, and in some instances, you can have entire reed beds on these sites, which are really important for a variety of different birds, um, but also aquatic invertebrates like um, sort of dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, but perhaps one of the, the sort of rare sites um, in South Wales and one that I'd like people to kind of look for elsewhere in the UK as well is these um, tufa springs. So this is where water that's really rich in calcium, uh, when it reaches the surface, it uh, deposits the calcium as calcium carbonate or what we call tufa. Um, and then you get these sort of specialist mosses and that, that sort of developed around these sort of very um, alkaline sort of rich um, springs. 
Um, and then you get some very specialist soldier flies then uh, that are associated with the mosses um, around these two for springs. And one of these is uh, the pygmy soldier fly, which you've got a female here that's egg laying directly into that tufa. And, and these um, sort of um, calcareous seepages are really rare um, microhabitat to support some of our rarest um, uh, species of soldier fly and crane flies as well. And where you've got sort of woodland habitat and um, the scrub, um, that's when you tend to get your more interesting sort of non-insect uh, invertebrates. So there's a wide variety of different millipedes that are found um, that in the UK are only found in South Wales on colliery sites, um, and even some species that are found nowhere else in the world as well. Um, so one of the more interesting species are things like the bear die beast, which is a species uh, that was found new to Britain from um, coom tips um, near bear die. Uh, but there's also been species found new to science for the Mardi monster. Uh, millipede is a species uh, found new to science from Mardi colliery at the top of the Rondler. Um, so that's the only site worldwide for that species. Uh, so it's a really exciting time to find new species in South Wales on these sites as well and really kind of shows how important they are. And just quickly, just to sort of set up uh, for Imogen's talk later on, I thought I'd just feature a slug and one of my favourite slugs on these colliery sites is the ghost slug, uh, which is an amazing species, ghost white, subterranean predator of earthworms uh, and just a, an amazing sort of uh, species to see, always a pleasure to see these. Um, so that was just a little quick run through of some of the species and habitat you get on these sites. But unfortunately, um, as amazing these sites are, the, the sort of vast um, array of different priority species they support, unfortunately, these sites are sort of seen as derelict waste land. And unfortunately, sites are being lost uh, at a continued rate um, and quite an alarming rate as well. So really, it's kind of what should be seen as an ecological asset. It's still quite often viewed as this problem in need of fixing. Um, and I think really that, you know, these colliery spot sites are a regional resource within South Wales, um, a national resource within the UK, um, and they really do need conservation, they also need investigation as well to find out more about the species that are found on them um, and their importance as well. And that's kind of where I come in really, I'm trying to raise awareness about how important these sites are, trying to sort of study them and learn more about um, their ecology and just trying to influence landowners and, you know, sort of um, the government and local authorities to really try to go out of their way to protect them and manage them uh, rather than um, put industrial estates or housing on them as well. So um, they are really important, unique landscape features and sites of high biodiversity significance, and I really do think they deserve to be protected. So thank you very much for that. Um, if you kind of want to find out more about my work or you want to uh, support my work, so I'm largely working off um, donations at the moment, uh, then do visit my website, which is colliesball.com. Um, and you're also welcome to follow me on, on Twitter and Facebook as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liam. That was um, a, a fans, fascinating tour of some really intriguing habitats and, and species. And as always, it's really intriguing to see the intricate mix of these things in these, some of these sort of micro habitat features that are supporting particular specialities. And bonus marks, of course, for featuring a soldier fly. So uh, <laughs> I don't <even> like that. <laughs> We, we've got just a minute or two for, for questions and there, there's been quite a few popping up. Um, one which I think is a fairly straightforward question from John, have all the plants arrived on their own or have any of them been introduced? Uh, the vast majority of them, on the, the vast majority of sites, this is just the national, uh, the natural seed bank, yeah, so just colonised on their own accord. Um, and not often these sites are basically kind of relics of kind of what we had you know, back in the, you know, 60s and, and before in the natural surroundings and they just come in on their own accord and they become these little islands really of kind of what, yeah, what, what used to be in the area and we kind of lost the, the other habitats um, around them, you know, but, um, but yeah, they, very few were, were sort of seeded in any way. Okay. Um, and a couple of questions from, from Mike and from Martin to do with the, the threats to the habitats really, which, which you touched on at the end there. Um, one of them is, is, is there a threat from habitat restoration, Can, um, given that these are such unique um, habitats that developed on their own? Uh, and uh, Martin pointed out that there is um, the, the current um, trend for tree planting could be seen as a danger to some of these places. Is, is yeah. that part of the threat that they're facing? Yeah, that's a real concern we have in South Wales at the moment, especially because the Welsh 
Welsh Government are really keen on a national forest for Wales and I, we kind of have a feeling that they're going to target the South Wales Valleys as an industrial landscape um, and want to sort of plant their post-industrial sites um, for, for tree planting. So it is a major concern at the moment, especially, you know, as well as community groups, you know, trying to do that, you know, make a difference and they think that, you know, planting trees might be a good thing. Um, but yeah, it is a, a major concern at the moment. I think more of a concern with with development on the site more than anything um, and also remediation for sort of safety concerns and that sort of thing they're probably bigger threats but but i do think tree planting is is one that's you know coming at the forefront at the moment with with welsh government's push for a national forest yeah great. okay yeah 